Um, this is a, is a really big topic to cover in, in less than 20 minutes. Um, I'm focusing uh, on a few aspects um, that we also studied here in Berlin, and, and um, hopefully we can, we can then continue in the discussion if you are interested in other aspects. So um, I think as clinicians for us, it became obvious um, in, in the spring or early in, in, the, in the pandemic in the spring of, of 2020 uh, that this syndrome called COVID-19 um, really is highly variable um, and that it uh, manifests uh, in, in consecutive phases if you wish. So after um, infection of the host you have a quite rapid uh, uh, or very rapid viral replication and unfortunately um, the infected hosts are already um, able to transmit the virus in this pre-symptomatic state which uh, makes this uh, a spe specifically tricky to control um, and at the time uh, of uh, symptom onset that is about uh, when viral replication in the upper airways that is in the mucosa of the nose and the uh, and the nasopharynx uh, reaches uh, its peak and um, that's when symptoms that are quite um, quite unspecific um, uh, manifest, such as uh, uh, fever, uh, headaches, you know, just uh, um, symptoms of, of any uh, flu-like illness, if you wish, viral infection. And um, for the vast majority, uh, vast majority of patients, luckily, um, those uh, symptoms will then um, subside over a, a period of um, one or a week or, or, or uh, 10 days. But a fraction of patients somehow after in the second and in the third week will deteriorate and develop pneumonia, which is then associated with uh, coughing with shortness of breath due to um, uh, uh, difficulties in oxy oxygenating uh, the blood. And, uh, and, and another fraction of those will be unable to control this uh, viral infection of the, of the lung and, and um, uh, develop critical illness, which requires ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, maybe organ replacement therapies. And uh, um, from the beginning, um, clinicians and scientists have been interested in um, understanding uh, this heterogeneity and what determines uh, the path uh, at, at specifically here from between um, resolution of the disease and deterioration and development uh, of, of critical illness. And uh, particularly given that viral loads are already um, uh, um, declining and, and sometimes already quite low, at least in the upper respiratory tract at the time where the patients deteriorate, um, early on brought about the hypothesis that the development of severe COVID and COVID-associated ARDS is mainly driven by unchecked or uncontrolled uh, inappropriate host responses. And as we know, many host factors determine the outcome, such as age, uh, gender, uh, um, uh, BMI, and, and, and as well as genetics. So um, what is, I'm, I'm supposed to talk about the lungs. So what, is, what do the lungs of COVID patients look like? So um, these were some of the first radiographs that we saw from uh, patients. So this is a healthy control and a patient coming in with viral pneumonia and you see these patchy infiltrates and, and it's classically there are in, in both lungs. And this is a patient who already has difficulties breathing and is, is, uh, has a fever and is coughing. And then uh, unfortunately this patient here deteriorated and you can see how the how the lung, which is normally an air, 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 mainly air-filled space, and this uh, therefore appears uh, dark, and the radiograph uh, becomes more and more white as a sign of infiltration, uh, a lipid, uh, a fluid accum accumulation, um, and destruction of of ba basically healthy lung tissue. And this is the full-blown picture of uh, uh, COVID ARDS, and this patient then required mechanical ventilation. Um, you can also look at it in a more uh, a more detailed fashion. This was actually used early on when when uh, uh, diagnostic capacities were still somewhat limited. Some patients that came in with typical symptoms received a CT scan, and you could even from the picture tell that the very high probability this patient had uh, COVID pneumonia. And this what is classical for COVID pneumonia: these ground glass opacities. So no normally you would see this dark lung parenchyma, and you have these sort of hazy infiltrates that are a bit diffuse on, in both uh, uh, lungs and they can be patchy and, and quite distal. Um, and uh, then later on, some of these patients uh, develop some of these consolidations. So the lung tissue really consolidates 
um, which, uh, which we're going to look into a bit more in detail. And this can be more widely spread and, and, um, and uh, consolidations and even fibrosis, what I'm going to tell you about uh, later on. So this is what the lung in COVID patients can look like. It's very, um, it's, it's a very uh, uh, distinctive uh, uh, picture, which, which uh, oftentimes uh, can already uh, be seen early on. So, um, and, and early on, the um, colleagues here at Charité also performed autopsy studies and, and there were some other autopsy cohorts that were uh, uh, published early on in the pandemic that gave some insights into what is happening on the, uh, <clears throat> on, on the uh, microscopic level in the lung. So this is a uh, lung explant from a 61-year-old patient who unfortunately died due to COVID uh, ARDS with multi-organ failure. And this, um, this uh, image here is a healthy lung tissue where you see all the alveolar spaces, a very, uh, uh, um, a, uh, a very fine and, and, and uh, elegant architecture of the lung, which is completely destroyed in this patient. So the, you have diffuse alveolar damage uh, and the alveoli are filled up with uh, debris of dying cells, invading immune cells, and hemorrhage. And uh, when you stain for certain immune cells, what was uh, prominent uh, early on, and I'm going to talk about that, is an infiltration of myeloid cells, such as macrophages, as well as other myeloid cells, including neutrophils. Um, so ARDS is a very hard to treat syndrome, and it's a very severe illness. And we are basically still, as of today, lacking good therapies for ARDS. We can ventilate patients and we can put them on ECMO, but the root cause is very hard to treat. So this is an overview uh, that was published a few years ago in the New England Journal. And you can see a healthy alveolus um, that is basically this very fine uh, epithelial lining with a very thin um, uh, uh, space between the um, epithelium and the endothelium of the accompanying um, uh, capillaries, which allows for diffusion of, of uh, gas exchange. Um, and this barrier obviously is very, very fragile and you need to maintain this, um, this barrier here to, uh, to maintain uh, sufficient gas exchange. And now in, in ARDS, due to an uh, inflammatory insult or other forms of insult such as COVID infection, you have infection of the epithelial lining and injury of the epithelial lining and this injury can extend to the um, capillaries and you have uh, entry of, of, uh, of fluids uh, from the capillary system and leaky capillaries into the edema fluid into the alveolus, which will obviously um, obstruct um, a gas exchange. But you also have intravascular coagulation, a very prominent feature uh, of COVID ARDS, uh, which I'm not going to talk too much about, but you have severe end endothelial pathology and intravascular coagulation. Uh, appearing also at the microvascular level, and that was demonstrated in several autopsy studies. And, and later stages, which uh, with normal forms of ARDS occur quite rarely, involve uh, a repair response that involves proliferation of, of uh, 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 t connective tissue cells such as fibroblasts and deposition of, uh, of, uh, of uh, extracellular matrix. And this is very hard to treat and is associated with prolonged mechanical ventilation and a poor outcome. Um, so the, the, one of the questions was what causes endothelial damage and what causes um, um, this, this hyperinflammatory syndrome. And there are uh, gazillions of papers out there and there's no way we can cover this. I just want to mention this because this was published a month ago uh, by my dear colleague Birgit Zawitzki together with several other um, groups here, Charité, Niels Blüten's group, and my student uh, worked on this. And what they found was that there is a way by which um, complement contributes uh, to the damage. And we know that complement is heavily involved. Many studies have uh, um, an identified complement activation in, in severe COVID, and they identified a mechanism by which uh, complement can drive a certain T cell phenotype that responds to circulating immune complexes and is um, excessively cytotoxic and maybe damaging endothelial barriers and contribute um, to damage in COVID ARDS. But I'm not going to talk too much about this. I want to focus on what I showed you early on is macrophage, and, uh, uh, so myeloid cell infiltrations in the lung. This was a review published early 2020 where my former colleagues at the Mount Sinai in New York put forward the hypothesis that inflammatory macrophages as well as alternatively activated macrophages might be contributing um, to the tissue damage observed in COVID ARDS. <clears throat> 
So uh, indeed, the myeloid cell compartment is severely impaired uh, in COVID. And this was a study that we um, performed together with Joachim Schulz's group in Bonn in 2020. And we identified um, uh, that patients, uh, the ones that um, fail to clear the infection and to and that deteriorate and move on to um, severe COVID ARDS, they show a severe impairment uh, specifically of myeloid cells in their circulation. For instance, the monocyte lineage um, uh, is, um, is quite defective. It has low levels of MHC molecules and has a certain molecule called CD163, which is a scavenger receptor. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, but they express certain other uh, molecules, such as alarmants, and they are quite distinct from the type of activation that we see in monocytes and myeloid cells in patients with mild or uh, moderate forms of COVID ARDS. There are also this. Um, uh, dis uh, or immature neutrophils and, and suppressive forms of, of neutrophils that we see in the circulation, um, which we also see with other patients with sepsis. They are a sign of emergency myelopoiesis. So a good evidence, which was also uh, validated by other groups, that the myeloid cell compartment in patients that um, develop severe COVID is severely impaired. To get a more uh, higher uh, um, uh, resolution on the responses that occur in the lung, we teamed up with a lot of groups and performed, um, uh, did a multi-pronged approach here where we analyzed uh, BAL fluid, so lavage fluid from patients with severe COVID. We looked at autopsy samples and imaging studies um, to get a better understanding of what is happening in those patients uh, on, uh, on the ventilator. And one aspect I think many uh, uh, ICU physicians will um, ascertain you of is that um, many of the COVID patients really require prolonged treatment. And they've been on respirators for a very long time. We have this very high mortality rate of about 50%. Um, so one thing that we uh, noted in our study, which I also showed you um, in these very early autopsy studies, is that we have a severe accumulation of macrophages. And I told you I want to talk about macrophages, so this is not so surprising. And those macrophages also seem to take up SARS-CoV-2 RNA transcripts. So th this is what macrophages do. They, they scavenge and they phagocytose debris, and they probably also take up free variants as well as infected um, ap apoptotic and necrotic cells, again, in this completely destroyed lung architecture. Um, what was striking was that um, these COVID-associated uh, macrophages um, almost all express this uh, scavenger receptor, um, CD163, uh, um, which is a marker that has been used for so-called alternatively activated macrophages, a term that is a bit outdated. Nonetheless, this uh, characterizes a macrophage that is not that much inflammatory, but is more involved in um, in, in, in tissue regeneration or in other forms of inflammation um, rather than those hyperinflammatory macrophages, which had also been hypothesized in, in COVID. And you can see how they accumulate uh, uh, in patients with COVID as compared to patients that died of other causes. Now, um, I, uh, we, we analyzed this at a greater resolution using single cell RNA sequencing um, of BAL fluids, so lavage fluids from patients that were on ECMO treatment on our ICU. And uh, without going into too much detail of all the different gene expression profiles, we identified a very prominent population that was again marked by very high expression of this molecule CD163, um, along with a number of other molecules that are associated with tissue repair, damage responses, lipid metabolism, and uh, fibrosis. And um, to and since this um, this uh, this uh, signature that we found in those cells reminded uh, us very much of of studies that we had read on other diseases, um, we we compared them to other forms of of um, of diseases in which macrophages um, seem to play a role in propagating aberrant tissue repair. And um, this is a very severe and uh, disease. It's called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's a chronic uh, fibrotic disease that leads to destruction of the lung and is, 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 um, is basically untreatable. Uh, and it occurs in, in older males above the age of 60. And, and this is a very, very poor, uh, with very poor prognosis. And when we, um, we extracted transcriptional signatures from uh, alveolar ma from macrophages that were found in this chronic fibrotic disease and projected those signatures onto um, our uh, uh, macrophage populations that we had, had identified in patients 
you know, that do not suffer from idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but from COVID ARDS. And we can see a very high um, uh, um, match here uh, when we project the signature onto this um, CD163 positive macrophage population. This is shown here in another way. So there is a high similarity between macrophages that accumulate in the lung in COVID and that are found in the lungs of patients with this chronic fibrotic uh, 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 lethal disease. And to do this in a more unbiased fashion, and I'm, I'm not going to bore you with all the details here, this was done in a very sophisticated manner by Fabian Theis group at, at the Helmholtz Center in Munich. They integrated all these different data sets that had been generated and published in the literature with our data set and with other data sets that were generated in COVID-19. This was done in order to compare how similar the macrophages uh, seen in different pulmonary diseases and COVID-19 were. First of all, there was high similarity in the COVID data sets, but also there was a high similarity uh, with IPF, so idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis associated macrophages, specifically in the CD163 positive macrophage population. So again, validating in a more unbiased fashion here that we do see a high uh, transcriptional similarity. And when we zoom into the lung, we can really see A in red, you can see all the macrophages that accumulate in the lungs here of COVID patients with severe COVID ARDS, but in green you can see what is called a myofibroblast. So this is a specific type of fibroblast that produces, that sits in the, um, that sits in the, this in the connective tissue and produces collagen and other extracellular matrix proteins and will lead to the remodeling of the lung tissue. You can see how this delicate architecture of the lung is completely destroyed here and you have a massive expansion of these fibroblast cells. And again we can use a uh, single cell or single nuclei sequencing techniques and without going into detail we can just see that those fibroblasts are not only massively expanded they are heavily activated and produce a lot of matrix and and using bioinformatic tools we can see how those macrophage subsets that we had identified talk to the fibroblasts in in the lung um, based on receptor and ligand interactions that we compute here and this was done uh, by by christian conrad's group at the berlin institute of health and um, um Sorry, I'm going to skip this. Um, and um, to, to basically have another look at, do we actually see fibrosis on, in those patients? So do we see this fibroproliferative stage of ARDS? We did a small cohort study here on our ICU patients. And what we can see, A, is that we see a restrictive phenotype. So there is a very much reduced um, volume um, uh, in, uh, in of the vital capacity, and you can see massive, massive fibrosis in patients on the ventilator. We can also see this by um, autopsies and staining, not going into detail here. All the brown that you see is extracellular matrix, and even on the uh, ultrastructural level, you can see features of fibrosis that you normally would see in IPF. And I'm also skipping this because of time, but SARS-CoV-2 seems to be inducing a signature that we see in the lung directly in the macrophages. So a healthy uh, monocyte, when it sees SARS-CoV-2, somehow takes on some of the features of these fibrosis-associated macrophages, and this is shown here and here. So to sum this up, what we think is happening, we have in some patients, we have infection of the deep lung tissue and the, um, and the epithelium is damaged, those damaged and, and necrotic cells are dying and incoming monocytes are being recruited. They differentiate into this peculiar uh, macrophage subset that is taking up uh, viral particles and dead cells. It leads to barrier damage and fluid um, extravasation. But in the second step, somehow these macrophages engage in interactions and produce a lot of factors that stimulate fibroblasts to produce a lot of um, uh, matrix and to proliferate. So this is somehow an uncontrolled repair response, and this can lead to fibrosis. And this is associated, we think, with the high mortality that we observe in patients with COVID ARDS. But some of the patients actually make it when they have been on the ventilator for a very, very long time. And I'm finishing with this. You can see how the lung is all white, but somehow after 183 days, this patient could be weaned from the respirator. And you can see how it uh, somehow all these consolidations and also fibrosis was resolved. And this is, I think, something that we can learn from fibrosis. What can we learn from COVID survivors? How can fibrotic lesions be resolved? And this is something that we would like to study right now to learn and maybe identify new therapeutic targets for chronic fibrotic diseases. 
I have to thank a lot of people, um, especially uh, my students here performed some of the work, all of our collaborators, and thank you for your attention. And I excuse if I went a little bit over time. Yeah, thank you very much for this very exciting uh, talk and uh, the vast amount of data. Um, I think already in the chat, I've seen three questions. So I um, call upon ah, Frau Rübsamen Chef. <laughs> I had to find the first one. So, so my question was uh, in this long COVID that we see and that sometimes develop with or without severe disease uh, before, um, how much long and lung involvement is there? Is there any mm -hmm. correlation? So there is a very good correlation with the initial severity of the injury and the amount of, of let's say, CT abnormalities that we see in follow-up studies. So there, we also published a small study on that, and there's other studies on that as well. So this is, this is quite obvious. However, I, I know a, a numerous patients that were ne never were in the ICU, that never had the most severe forms, that all of a sudden developed severe fibrosis. It's a, it's a subset of patients. It's not that many patients, but that develop fibrosis, even though their initial infection wasn't that severe. Um, so, and, and the other form of you know, long COVID is this, this um, basket, if you wish, of all these different uh, um, uh, post-COVID symptoms. Um, I think there is a subset of these younger patients that has this fatigue-like syndrome, which is probably very different from other patients that have severe impairment um, of their uh, lung capacity. Um, and and these, these need to be distinguished. But I think this fibroproliferative response occurs in a lot of patients, almost 100% of the ARDS patients, and, and those that survive somehow have the capacity to resolve most of it again. Thank you very much. Next one is Christine, Christine Falk. Yeah, thank you, Live. Very impressive data on the myeloid cells. My very short question, but may, that may be not so easy to answer is, you mentioned that they are infiltrating macrophages and then they convert or they contribute to the fibrotic phenotype. Do you think that you could revert the phenotype by alveolar macrophages that potentially would have a balancing role? And do you think that the balance between alveolar macrophages and those infiltrating ones that are converting is so to, so to Uh, a control mechanism that one could use even for therapeutic approaches. So, Christina, um, could you repeat the last sentence? This didn't I, I come th through. I think I got it. Okay, good. Um, so, the, <laughs> what, what I didn't show for, for the interest of time, so the alveolar macrophages are basically depleted early on because ah. they probably, I don't know, they, they die, and this is seen in influenza and other forms mm -hmm. of ARDS as well. Then they're being replaced by these myeloid, uh, by these monocyte-derived macrophages, and somehow they transi transition through this, what we call profibrotic state. And later on, when we go in late, then the alveolar macrophage niche is repopulated uh, by what we think is monocyte derived cells, and they also self, um, uh, they also replicate and can self renew. Um, and those alveolar macrophages have all the features that we that we know, but some of them also um, associated with some of those alveolar macrophages seen in fibrosis. So whether you can balance out the one against the other, I don't know. I mean, in the acute stage, this there's hardly any space in the alveolus, as I showed you. you. I don't know if you know bringing in other cells would help. But what we would definitely like to understand is how we, when are those molecular switches turned, when this this damage mm -hmm. repair response basically reverted back to actual resolution and then ending um, um, this constant influx of of, uh, of monocytes. Next question from Stefan Kaufmann. Um, wonderful uh, life. Uh, my question is, we, we get uh, from other lung diseases, notably infectious disease, also all these different endotypes, which indicate there's a hyper and hypo. So you said it's a rather homogeneous pattern. Is that, um, um, other, and, and, and obviously you also have some people disposing diseases. So my question really is, is there also evidence that different um, endotypes, hyper, hypo, in a single way uh, occur? Yeah, I mean, of course, we would like okay, to know so, um, early on yeah. um, uh, who, who is prone to develop this type of fibroproliferative ARDS, so the most severe form. And, and I have to say, mm -hmm. um, with Omicron, we see that a bit less uh, um, uh, frequent, but this is very early days. Yeah, But um, so 
some peculiar aspects. So who, who is most prone to develop severe COVID ARDS? It's elderly males. Yeah, and the same is true for IPF, basically, and the history of smoking. There's some some risk factors that somehow overlap. We don't know. I I don't. This is this can be pure coincidence or or you know have something to do. Um, it is true that it's quite homogeneous because we can take uh, uh, samples that were generated in a different group on a different set of patients, and those patients are small cohorts. They are quite heterogeneous in terms of you know their ethnicity and so on, and we get an almost perfect match of the transcription signatures so somehow this is a very conformational response and even this when we extract the signatures they look super similar to macrophages found in liver fibrosis or other organs so this must be a very conserved type of, of repair response a program that is initiated that i guess is normally good but it's just some seems to be unchecked and uncontrolled and whether other endotypes um, there exist like subforms of this i don't know i hope i got the question right yeah. Next question is from Alexander Sheffold. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Live. So really great data. So, and my, my question goes in the same direction um, because you mentioned that it's the, this fibrotic response comes from a direct interaction between the virus and the macrophage. And if you if this is the case, how can you then explain this different outcome? Is the macrophages from old people are they different, or are you maybe? missing a difference in the adaptive immune response, which is different in young and old. Yeah, I mean, obviously this is uh, oversimplified here. Um, what I, so what, the one question that we wanted to address is this simply a response to damage. And we know that damaged cells, apoptotic cells elicit a TGF beta response in phagocytes, and this is all well known, but we have, this is not a ventilation, uh, associated damage because those patients were hardly ventilated. They're on ECMO. There's, they're, they're hardly ventilated anymore. There's no mechanical damage to the lung at that moment anymore. And um, also the signatures, when we incubate the cells with influenza, we don't see the signature with influenza A virus. So so this is some, something that is triggered by, by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's triggered in healthy monocytes from young volunteers that would probably not develop severe disease. So I rather think this is a beneficial response that somehow in, in, in predisposed individuals is, goes unchecked. And then, so this is a tissue repair response. This is a counter response that is probably good and that probably protects younger people from, from developing the severe ARDS, but it's somehow unchecked. And this is why it leads to then at some stage fibroproliferation. I guess it's a bit what, what you know, scarring and, and fibrosis means in general. It's, a, it's normally a good type of, of tissue repair response that then goes away. Next question. But of course, there's the adaptive immune system, Alex, that 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 plays a role mm -hmm. that we haven't investigated here. That that's that's very obvious. So we go to Andreas Radbruch. If Thomas comes along, then we can. Yeah, life. I, 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 yeah, I can do it very short. Uh, so I was just wondering whether you could comment on uh, is, is your idea that the, many of these patients have autoantibodies to interference. So is that the immune complexes that? trigger somehow and that pre that predispose already to to bad outcome i mean those this uh, yeah i mean this subgroup of patients with autoantibodies to interfere on there they have 100% mortality so i think this is this is a subgroup of patients that has a and they die pretty rapidly so they somehow very early on lose control of this infection and and uh, go down the wrong path um, and, and we did a, you know, there are these studies, published studies, and there's a small study here from Charité, same thing. All the patients with autoantibodies died. So, um, but, but obviously they cannot explain all of the severe outcomes because, you know, this is the, the, the group of, of patients with severe COVID is much larger than the ones with, with autoantibodies, whether there are, you know, other antibodies involved and, and at this stage, the there's, there's a bit of evidence that there's actually immune complexes with spike and and uh, and uh, so spike and antibodies, not not necessarily autoantigens. There's some evidence on that also in the for for netosis development and so on. Yeah, but maybe the autoantibodies against interferon are just the peak of the iceberg. Yes, yes, you're right, you're right. Of course, we don't know all the, they're, they're, I mean, they're, in COVID, if you measure the serum, obviously there's, there's tons of autoantibodies, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Yeah, you're right. Mm 